Good morning and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure today to introduce our Grand Rounds speaker, Chief Resident Scott Saunders. Scott is um, a graduate of the University of Texas where he graduated as a uh, uh, University of Texas Distinguished College Scholar and with highest honors in Phi Beta Kappa. He then went on to Baylor College of Medicine and then we were very fortunate to recruit him to our house staff program where he's distinguished himself and uh, is now a chief resident. Um, I would make note that the chiefs all have separate duties and Scott has worked closely with me in putting together a wonderful Grand Rounds series this year. Uh, he's uh, been involved in some research, most recently with Ryan Kipp, looking at the improvement of left ventricular ejection fraction after implantable cardioverter defibrillator placement. And he's had presentations at the Heart Rhythm Society uh, National Meeting and uh, University of Wisconsin Internal Medicine Research Day. He's also presented a poster at the American College of Physicians Wisconsin chapter and has had workshops at the Wisconsin Medical Education Day and participated in a workshop uh, at the Academic Internal Medicine Week in Baltimore in 2017. He's an avid teacher. Anybody who's been to his morning reports knows he's a talented and uh, a really a wonderful speaker. He uh, has worked as a clinical preceptor, as a faculty mentor, and has been active in the simulation center. He's been a good citizen, participating in various committees, including the Residency Curriculum Committee, the Global Health Task Force, and the Medicine Residency Wellness Committee. Along the way, he's earned a number of honors. I think uh, most distinguishing and, and perhaps predictable is that he uh, received our Department of Medicine Residency Dr. Seuss Award twice. And this is for the resident who is always good for a story or a laugh. Um, we're very proud that, that Scott's moving on to uh, take a position on the faculty at the University of Colorado as a uh, hospitalist, and we certainly wish him well there. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Saunders as he presents his first Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. My first shift as an intern was overnight in the ICU on my birthday. <laughs> I went to work and I was thrust into a completely new world. The hospital was new, writing orders was new, logging my duty hours and ACG me were new. Everything was new. I had been thrown into the deep end that is residency. But over time, I figured it out. Myself and my co-interns, we got our flippers on, we got our scuba tanks on, and we learned how to swim. And a world that had once been overwhelming and scary became like a second home to us. And reflecting on that reminds me of a joke that I love. OK, so there's these two fish, and they're swimming by each other. The first one says, hey, how's the water? To which the other replies, what is water? I love the joke. So. Uh, <laughs> I love it because I think it's, it's funny as a standalone joke, but also because it, it reflects my understanding as a resident. I was going through the process, but I didn't really understand the water, if you will, of residency, or why we do things the way that we do them in residency. But when I became a chief resident and found myself in a position to potentially affect change at the programmatic level, it became much more important for me to understand why we do things the way that we do them. And the further I dove into that and learned more about the history of residency, the more interested I became which led to today's Grand Rounds, War, Money, and Culture, Shaping Forces of the American Residency. I have no financial disclosures, and here's what I hope you take away today. I want you to be able to identify the impetus for the creation of residency. I want you to be able to recall major eras in residency since its inception, and to recognize future potential directions that residency may take. And we're going to approach it with the following framework. I'll start by talking about the conception of residency and how we moved from the apprenticeship model through the creation of medical school and into the creation of residency. And then I'll talk about three major eras that residency has gone through since its inception. These eras are largely the work of two medical historians, Arnold Relman and Kenneth Ludmerer. The first is the era of expansion, which refers to how residency took root in America and spread throughout the country. The sentinel event here leading into this era was World War I. The era was spurred on by World War II, 
and culminated in the development of regulatory bodies, or RRCs, um, as well as the match. The next era is the era of high throughput, which refers to the way that patients are um, processed in our system today, where they're admitted, treated, and then discharged as quickly as possible. This was brought on by the creation of Medicare and Medicaid, but more specifically by the shift in the payment scheme to diagnosis-related groups. And lastly, we'll talk about the era of accountability, which refers to the public keeping our profession accountable for their own safety. The sentinel event leading into this was the death of Louis Zion, and the era culminated with the creation of duty hours. So in colonial America, apprenticeship was how you became a doctor. As a medical student, you might live with your preceptor, you would see their patients with them, you would have access to their library and to their diagnostic instruments. But it wasn't an ideal way to train. There was no way a single preceptor would be able to teach you everything you might need to know to treat a population of patients later. There was no way for them to have all the books you might need to become a successful doctor. And so medical schools began to be created. The first one was uh, created in 1765 at the College of Phil Philadelphia, which would become the University of Pennsylvania. Medical school, at, at its inception, was different than it is now. It was completely didactic, so everything happened in a lecture hall. And the apprenticeship was a prerequisite for admission. So you didn't need clinical instruction in, med in medical school because you had already had it in your apprenticeship. But over time, as medical schools became more popular, the idea of the apprenticeship fell out of favor. And it was for those continued obvious reasons that there was no way for you to learn everything you needed from a single person. So the AMA was created in 1847, and they had this to say about the apprenticeship in 1867. Private pupillage, as it is now generally conducted, is worse than useless. It is, in fact, simply a waste of time and money without one solitary compensating advantage. But we had a problem, because after the apprenticeship fell out of favor and was no longer required for admission, we were left with the whole of medical training occurring in the confines of a medical school with no clinical instruction. So as a doctor, you would graduate without having ever treated patients and go into practice and learn and practice on your first set of patients, which most likely was going to be on the poor. So some astute medical students realized this was not a great idea um, and, and may not go well in their first few years of practice. So if you had the means, there were some other ways to gain additional training. One way was to become a house officer, which isn't what we think of when we say house officer today. This was a role that essentially transferred the apprenticeship from student and preceptor to student and hospital. So you might graduate from medical school, take a role at a hospital, and do menial labor for them, supply their stock rooms, things like that. Um, and then in return, you would have access to their doctors and get to learn and follow them around and ask them questions. Um, this was not a curated educational experience, but it was more on-the-job occupational training. I'm still very highly prized, though, and, and competitive to get these positions. Another option would be to try and specialize. So to try and become a specialty surgeon, for example. There were a few ways to do this. You could go to a for-profit school, take a course that lasted a few weeks, um, practice some procedures on dogs or cadavers, and then call yourself a specialist. A more legitimate way to, to specialize would be to travel to Europe, where they had embraced special, the idea of specialization um, far before America did. So in Europe, you could pay an instructor, and they might be a doctor in training themselves, uh, but to teach you at the bedside um, and give you clinical instruction. Some of the doctors who would become our best medical educators in America were trained in Europe, and more specifically in Germany. And they were exposed to a few really important things. First, they saw robust clinical teaching in these medical training centers. Second, they saw that uh, medical training was research-oriented. Scientific discovery and learning things in the lab and applying them to patients was highly valued um, and done frequently. And lastly, they were involved in a medical system where medical training took place in the confines of a university. So the ideas and principles that come along with a, with a university being uh, research-minded and hypothesis-driven was applied to medical training. So when these doctors came back from Germany, they brought with them everything that they had been exposed to and learned, and they also brought with them a knowledge that medical training in America was deficient. Along with the growing knowledge that there was deficiencies in medical training, there was a discontentment with academia in America in general at the time. 
we were no match for the scientific discovery and growth that was happening in Europe. And out of that discontentment, Johns Hopkins University was formed in 1876 as America's first research university. Unsurprisingly, 10 years later, when Johns Hopkins Hospital opened, there was a residency in place from day one. And the founders of this residency were Dr. Osler of Internal Medicine, Dr. Halstead of General Surgery, Dr. Kelly of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and Dr. Welch, who was in charge of the medical school and was trained as a pathologist. And the idea of these founders in creating this residency was to take medical training away from the on-the-job style training that was occurring for house officers at the time and transform it into a true graduate medical education experience. So research was very highly prized in this residency, and that's where the, most of the focus was. But the residents were also given primary responsibility for patients, which was a novel idea in America at the time. And along with that responsibility came good bedside teaching. The residency didn't look much like we think of residency today. Uh, each year they would, they would admit 12 interns. Each intern would get a 12-month appointment. And if you were good enough, you were asked to come back the next year. Uh, but some people were cut. So the next year you would be a, an assistant resident. You were given a 12-month appointment that had the option of being renewed if you continued to be good enough. Um, but again, more residents got cut. And then finally, if you survived every cut, you became the chief resident. Um, with a term that lasted indefinitely. However, <laughs> most people um, stayed about two years and then left. Uh, the longest one stayed for seven years. Um, interns during, or residents during this time lived in the hospital, um, and even some of the faculty did. Dr. Osler and Halstead both lived in the hospital um, until they were married. <laughs> and then they left. So Johns Hopkins was instrumental because they created the first true graduate medical um, experience. But they were also instrumental because they trained the next generation of medical educators that then went throughout the country and spread their ideas. Um, of Halstead's 17 chief residents, for example, 11 went on to form surgical residencies at other places like Stanford and Cornell and Vanderbilt. But even though these ideas were spreading, they didn't take high priority for medical educators because there were still a lot of problems with medical schools at the time. It was really profitable to own a medical school if all you had to do was rent out a lecture hall and then charge admission to students. And as a result, a lot of the schools that had opened were really open for profit and not um, with the students' best interests in mind. So in 1910, the Flexner Report came out. Uh, the Carnegie Foundation commissioned Abraham Flexner to go around America and a, a, to a few schools in Canada visit all, all of the medical schools and evaluate them. And he was looking at five things. First, at entrance requirements for these schools. Second, at the size and training of their faculty. Third, the financial state of the institution. Fourth, the adequacy of labs, of laboratories. And then lastly, relationships, if there were any, with nearby hospitals. Um, he visited a total of 156 medical schools, and he was ruthless in his evaluations. Um, he called one hospital a death trap, for example. Um, we did fairly well. He did call us a half school, which was <laughs> not an insult. Um, it was, it was, that was fine at the time. So we, we fared well, but a lot of schools did not. Um, Ten years after this was published, we were down to 82 schools in America from the 156 that he had originally visited. And we were better off for it in terms of medical education. The schools that were left upheld higher standards, they were more research oriented, um, and they had shored up relationships with nearby hospitals. It wasn't all good change though. Um, a few populations were adversely affected. So African American students at the time had seven schools that they were admitted to throughout the whole country. After this report, there was only two left. So if you wanted to be an, uh, a doctor and you were African American, it became much harder. He also noted um, the state of women doctors in America. And he's, he noted that from 1904 to 1909, the number of female graduates from medical schools had been declining, and the number of new admissions into medical schools um, were declining. And so he noted by going through all of these schools that there were ample opportunities for women at the time. And so his conclusions that he came to were that either women don't want to go into medicine or that there is no demand for female doctors. Um, so didn't exactly help uh, either of those populations. But with undergraduate medical education shored up, 
um, it now gave medical educators the chance to embrace uh, residency. So next we'll talk about the era of expansion and how residency spread throughout the country. The sentinel event here was World War I. So the United States entered into World War I in 1917. At the time, we had 1,600 doctors in the Medical Reserve Corps, but it quickly became apparent that we were going to need more to support the war effort. And so medical training camps were set up throughout the country to get the best of the best doctors and train them and prepare them to go to war. And they had selection criteria because they wanted the best doctors that America had to offer. First, you had to be invited by the Surgeon General, thinking that if you had a really bad reputation, you probably wouldn't um, pass this first hurdle. You had to graduate from a reputable medical college. You had to be licensed to practice in your state. You had to be in active practice. You had to pass an exam before a local board, again thinking that local doctors would probably know your reputation as well. And you had to pass an American Medical Association investigation into your professional history. But it quickly became apparent that the primary purpose of these camps was not going to be training doctors to go to war. It was going to be weeding out the doctors who were not good enough at all to go to war. And the leader of Camp Greenleaf, which was the largest of these camps, had this to say, that this selected class presented still further professional deficiencies, invites reflection on the part of all those in charge of medical education. This was the first time we had gathered doctors from around the country and compared them side by side, and it had really exposed how poorly trained many of our doctors were. Uh, and this same doctor went on to classify some of the types of doctors he was encountering in his camp. Um, internal medicine did pretty well. Uh, this is the, his uh, evaluation of surgical candidates. So he graded them from A plus to qualified minus. If you were qualified or below, that meant you were not going to be allowed to be a full-fledged surgeon. You might be able to be an assistant or to transport patients or, you know, do something like that. So he found that one of 2,600 um, general surgeons was an A-plus rating, um, and a majority of them were not qualified to practice as general surgeons. He also looked at other types of specialties, um, and he rejected a large number of those that he encountered. So, for example, ophthalmology, he rejected 51% of the doctors he got, and ENT docs, he rejected 70%. He noted that a large number of men actually practicing as specialists in this country and generally accepted as such are not duly qualified as the experts they are supposed to be. And he went further to say that some of these specialists probably shouldn't be practicing medicine in any capacity, even as a general practitioner. So out of this uh, realization that doctors were not qualified and we had no way to know if they were qualified came the formation of specialty boards and examinations for all of the existing specialties at the time. And these had two effects. First, it gave the public a way to know if their doctor that they were about to let do surgery on them was actually qualified to do that surgery. Had they just learned on dogs or had they actually set their examination and deemed qualified by a board? But secondly, it shored up residency in America as the only legitimate way of training. Because to sit for any of these boards, you had to have done a three-year residency. So the other ways of specializing faded. Hospitals were no longer hiring doctors that were not board certified. So those proprietary schools were no longer cutting it to get you to specialization. After World War I, traveling to Europe was um, not as enticing of an option for doctors as well. So we were left with specialty boards um, encouraging people to do residency. And so the, the idea of residency spread. So where were we after World War I? In 1925, there was a residency program at 29 hospitals. By 1939, there was residency programs at 518 hospitals. The nature of residency had changed as well. In Johns Hopkins, it had been very research focused, but with the advent of so many advancements in medicine, such as aseptic technique and IV fluids, um, blood transfusions, therapeutic agents to give patients, uh, residency had become more clinically oriented than research oriented. And there was still a lack of uniformity. So the ideas were still spreading, but there were things called short residencies that would last anywhere from 12 to 30 months, likely happening at community hospitals. And there was the long residency um, that was three or more years and the long residency was being shored up by those um, board examinations. So at the time of World War II, we had better doctors. 
um, mortality was better for World War II because of, partially because of medical advancements um, and the training of our doctors. Um, and the doctors that were enlisted to go over in World War II, specialists and general practitioners both went, but specialists were treated much better than general practitioners. They're given better pay and better rank and better assignments. And the general practitioners that were overseas saw those counterparts and how well they were trained. So when World War II ended, uh, educators knew that there, were, there was going to be a big influx into residency because a lot of the population had put off medical training or had interrupted their residency to go to war. But they didn't expect the large number of general practitioners that maybe had even been in practice for years before going to war who came back and all of a sudden wanted to enter into the residency and get that specialty training um, that they had seen so highly valued by the military. And so the era of expansion was bolstered by that um, influx into the residency. So what have we talked about so far? World War I showed us that we had inadequate doctors and inadequate training. That led to the development of specialty boards that shored up the idea of residency because you had to have done a residency to sit for a board exam. By World War II, we had better doctors and those that were uh, board certified were treated better. So it led to a big influx into the residency programs. Um, and that led to finally a need to regulate these programs. Um, there had to be some way to say if a program was good enough for each um, respective specialty. So that led to the development of residency review committees um, that were trying to, to unif make things uniform across specialties. Um, and it also led to the development of the match. By this time, there were so many students going into residency um, and it really was not fair to them how hospitals were offering jobs. Um, and so the match was created in 1951. So we've talked about the conception of residency, how residency expanded throughout America, um, brought on by World War I and II. And now we'll talk about the era of high throughput, um, referring to how patients are quickly admitted and discharged. And this was brought on by the passage of Medicare and Medicaid by Lyndon Johnson in 1965. So this had a huge effect on teaching hospitals who had prided themselves for all time, basically, throughout their existence for taking care of charity patients. They took care of the poorest of the poor and of the elderly that didn't have any family left. But all of a sudden, with the passage of Medicare and Medicaid, they were being paid for the work that they had always done. So there was a huge influx of clinical income for teaching hospitals. So now faculty were being paid more and more competitive salaries compared to private practice, um, and also residents were starting to get paid more as well. Another effect of Medicare and Medicaid was that healthcare was more universally accessible, and so the number of patients that each hospital was treating rose, and resident workload continued to become even more and more clinically um, oriented. There's always been a, um, a strain in residency between clinical obligations and education, and educators saw that it was starting to get too heavy towards clinical obligations. And so uh, an answer to that was to hire more residents, which was helped in part by Medicare, um, and Medicare provided funding for residency positions. Um, so residency continued to grow. Um, hospitals were growing. It was a prosperous time um, for teaching hospitals. But along with that prosperity came ever-rising healthcare costs. Uh, we continued to have medical advancements throughout this whole time, and, and the cost of health care continued to rise. And so the government um, tried to put a stop to this in 1983. When Medicare was first rolled out, there was a retroactive payment scheme, meaning that if you admitted a patient with, let's say, heart failure, you would admit them, treat them appropriately, do everything you needed to do, and discharge them. Medicare would look at everything you had done and then um, reimburse you appropriately for all of those services. Well, in 1983, the government passed um, diagnosis-related groups as a, a way to um, set up a prospective payment scheme. So now that same patient with heart failure was given a fixed amount of dollars or whatever diagnosis they were coming in for. So if you were able to um, treat them and spend less than that um, allocated number of dollars, then you would make money. But if you treated them and they had, let's say they had a really long hospital stay and complications, you would over, uh, overspend past that uh, allocated number, and then you would lose money. So the effect of this was that hospitals had to decrease lengths of stay to make money. That was the best way to save money for each um, admission. 
So looking at this trend of average length of stays, in 1940, the average length of stay was 16 days. In the early 1980s, it was 10 to 12. The passage of diagnosis-related groups was in 1983, and by the late 1980s, we had seen stays fall to five to six days. The trend has continued to decrease them. Not much has changed since 2012. Um, we're still around four and a half days. Um, I thought this was really interesting. I found this on a hospital consulting firm's website, and it's a scheme showing how a hospital might um, make more money if they decrease length of stays. So at the top, you have average hospital sizes. So their example, they're using a 400-bed hospital. And on the left side, you have um, how much you decrease your length of stay by. So for their example, they say, if you decrease length of stay by one day for patients in a 400-bed hospital, um, this number is the, the number of hospital beds that you would be essentially adding to the hospital by doing so. Um, so it's a really good way to open up um, your hospital for business. But I think it's most telling that these days are broken into quarter days. So it's profitable to even discharge someone six hours earlier than you might have otherwise, um, which I think we can all, we've all seen um, in practice how this still affects hospitals. So what effects did this era have on the residency? Well, first, it, it, it increased resident workload. Patient censuses actually didn't change very much for residents um, on teaching services, but it did increase the number of admissions and discharges that residents were doing. And as internal medicine doctors, an HNP or good HNP is a, one of the most time-consuming things that we do, and planning and coordinating a good discharge is also one of the most time-consuming things we do. So residents, um, that, that balance was pushed further towards the clinical obligation side. It was harder to observe disease progression. Um, I think all of us are familiar that we'll discharge patients on new medications or we'll titrate a medicine and dis discharge them the same day. We don't get to see how that pans out. Um, I think we've all discharged patients where we don't have a diagnosis. Things are still pending and the primary care doctor is going to follow up on it. So we've done all this work and tried to learn from the patient, but we don't know what we treated exactly. It was harder to be an attending as well. If you loved to teach and you all of a sudden found yourself on a service with 10 new admissions on a post-call day, that might um, lessen your love of teaching. It was, it was harder to, you couldn't spend an hour on each patient, you know, talking about the fine points of a physical exam. Um, and it led to a cultural shift towards efficiency and speed. It led to the idea that these were the most important things and that um, you know, maybe educational conferences were less important when you had to admit and discharge so many people. Um, so that strain continued in residency. And with that shift towards efficiency and speed, there was less time for the things that give us reward in medicine. There was less time for meaningful patient en encounters, and there was less time for meaningful time with each other and talking about cases over lunch, for example. Um, I reflected on my own time in residency um, when I was creating this talk. I, I went back and looked at um, one VA ward that I had gone through. I did 65 discharge summaries during that month-long period. Um, and I think all of our residents can attest to the fact that we don't eat lunch with each other when we're on wards. We eat it with the computer, you know, while we're um, writing notes. But lastly, hospitals closed, and more specifically, rural hospitals closed. If your hospital was not able to change the way that it operated to make money in this new payment scheme, um, it closed. And along with these hospitals, um, any associated residency programs closed. So from 1980 to 1988, 10% of rural hospitals in America closed their doors. And so there was an influx of, residency, of residents away from areas of need, of rural areas, towards more urban areas that didn't really need more doctors. So we've talked about the era of expansion where residency spread throughout the country, the era of high throughput where medicine changed because of the way we're reimbursed um, to become much more um, high paced. And now we'll talk about the era of accountability where the public let us know that how we were taking care of them was not acceptable. Libby Zion was an 18 year old woman. In January of 1984, she was started on phenylzine, which is an MAOI for depression. Um, in late February, she was seen for otalgia and fever and was prescribed an antibiotic, but by early March uh, was presented to New York Hospital for persistent fever. She was admitted at 2 a.m. The intern and resident that worked her up had been working for 18 hours already, 
She denied cocaine use at the time, but later traces were found on autopsy. On exam, she was febrile at 100.3, she was writhing, and she had a hyperemic right tympanic membrane with a white count of 18,000. The intern and junior resident both assessed her independently um, and came to the same conclusion that this was probably a viral syndrome, and they discussed this over the phone with their attending who agreed with their care plan. So their plan was to give her IV fluids, give her Tylenol for fever, and to, to give her meperidine for agitation. Meperidine is the same thing as Demerol. It's a synthetic opioid. And it's contraindicated in patients on phenylzine because of the risk of serotonin syndrome. So at 4 a.m., a nurse noted that Libby was restless and confused. The intern was notified twice about this, didn't go to reassess her, but ordered restraints in haloperidol um, from her call room. At 6 a.m., the patient was calm and was able to take Tylenol by mouth, so her restraints were removed. But by 6.30, she was febrile to 107.6, went into respiratory arrest, and died. This case likely would not have made national headlines if it weren't for her father, um, Sidney Zion, who was a graduate of Yale Law, had worked as the assistant U.S. attorney for New Jersey, and had worked as an investigative journalist um, in the state of New York. And he had worked at many prominent um, publications, including the New York Times. So he convinced um, the New York County District Attorney to start a grand jury investigation into his daughter's death. And the fallout from this investigation was huge. Ultimately, the grand jury did not criminally indict um, the residents um, and didn't find the hospital at, at blame. But they did raise several concerns and recommendations about medical training in our country. They noted a few things. First, they thought there was inadequate in-person supervision. They had just talked to this attending over the phone, and no attending had evaluated uh, the patient since she showed up in the hospital. They thought you shouldn't be able to order restraints without actually going to reassess the patient. They noted that a computerized system may have prevented this if, if that contraindication had popped up um, instead of everything being on paper charts. And they also noted that you know, maybe cons excessive consecutive working hours had contributed uh, to Libby's death. And this last point became the talking point for the public and for the media because it was a common sense argument if there were duty hours for pilots and truck drivers, why were there not limits on the number of hours a doctor could work who holds life and death in their hands? And so the New York State Department of Health, after this grand jury investigation, launched their own investigation. And they ended up making 17 recommendations. They endorsed basically everything that the grand jury had recommended. And one of 17 recommendations um, was with regard to duty hours. They recommended an 80-hour work week for residents and a maximum shift length for residents as well. So I want to take a, a second to talk about where the 80-hour work week came from. What, where did we get this number of 80 hours? So Bertrand Bell was the doctor in charge of this New York State Health Department investigation. Um, and he was at his beach house with two of his physician friends kind of mulling this idea over uh, what's a good number to recommend. So his friend had this thought. Okay, there's 168 hours in a week. A 10-hour day for five days a week is reasonable for doctors. So that gives us 50 daytime hours of work. So 168 minus 50 equals 118 nighttime hours. Well, Q4 call is humane. So 118 nighttime hours divided by four is 30 hours. If you add the 50 daytime hours to the 30 nighttime hours, you have an 80-hour work week. And this is the basis of duty hours in our country. So in 1989, the New York State Health Code um, passed duty hours into law in New York State. Um, and residency review committees at the time suggested that the rest of the country follow suit, but they weren't enforcing that. They just said, this is probably a good idea. And things died down, and New York hospitals didn't change much. It was going to be very expensive to make all these changes. No one was enforcing them, so they just kept things the way that they were. But in the mid-1990s, there were several more high-profile patient safety cases that brought this back to the forefront. So an example is Betsy Lehman, who was being treated at the Dana-Ferber Institute, and she was supposed to receive cisplatin each day for four days. But each day she came to the hospital, she got the total four-day dose each of those days. So she was overdosed on cisplatin. 
1999, the Institute of Medicine had done um, research into patient safety events, and they published To Air is Human. The, the results weren't necessarily surprising that patient, um, patients were being adversely affected by mistakes from time to time, but the scope of these errors was surprising. So they found that 50,000 to 100,000 patients um, died each year as a result of preventable medical errors. And while the public generally doesn't know about Institute of Medicine reports, a survey showed that at the time, 51% of the general public knew about this report and what it showed. So this all culminated in 2001 and 2002 with legislation being introduced both into the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. Ultimately, it was not passed by Congress because most people thought that the profession should handle themselves. Um, but it became clear that if our profession did not handle um, itself, that the U.S. government was willing to step in and do that for us. So we were kind of pushed in 2002 to the creation of duty hours by ACGME. So ACGME um, mandated the following, no more than 80 hours per week on average, a 24 plus 6 hour call maximum shift length, maximum Q3 of night call, one 24 period hour, uh, one 24 hour period off per week on average, and then uh, they mandated 10 hours off between shifts. They wanted to avoid this, the problem that had happened in New York with nobody paying attention to the rules and um, going on with things as usual. And so they came down hard initially with, uh, with these rules. So I, ironically, Johns Hopkins Internal Medicine Program was the first program to lose its accreditation because of this. Um, and, and that was because they had call too frequently in one rotation. And that was a huge deal because if you were not accredited by, accredited by ACGME, you did not get Medicare funding. So the hospital lost a ton of money if they were not accredited. But these hours were not passed without ample objections. So let, let's talk about what some of those were. First, there was no evidence that fatigue led to patient harm. At the time, we had studies showing that tired doctors did less well on um, written exams or on psychomotor tests but there was no evidence that that translated to harming patients. Second, they noted this was going to be really expensive. So just in New York City alone, it was going to cost an estimated $200 million per year to get all of the hospitals to comply with duty hours. Um, there was a concern that there was going to be a paradoxical decrease in patient safety. If you're shortening resident shift length, that means you need more doctors to cover the same amount of patients, and you're going to have a handoff every time a shift ends. So maybe that's going to make patient safety actually worse. There was a concern that there would be a degradation of professionalism and the identity of being a doctor. Were residents going to see themselves now as shift workers who got to leave at five no matter what, or were they still going to hold the patient first um, above themselves? And lastly, there was a worry uh, that there would be a decrease in educational quality. And this was... Uh, the, big, the biggest concern for this was in surgical specialties, where it was important to learn the techniques that went along with actually performing a surgery, but it was equally or more important to, to know when to take that patient to surgery and who was a good surgical candidate and who was not, and then how to manage that same patient in the post-operative period. So a handoff at any point within that whole pre, um, peri and post-operative period uh, would decrease learning. So let's look at some of the evidence that has been amassed uh, since duty hours were passed. First, we'll look at the decrease in patient safety. Were patients safer after duty hours? Well, in 2013, ACGME um, compiled all of the safety data that had been accrued since that time. So these were looking at patient safety before and after the 2002 duty hours. So on the left, we have single institution studies, which I, I won't get into because it, it's hard to imagine that this would be very generalizable data across the whole country, across all specialties. But there were some nas national data samples um, using the VA or Medicare data um, to look at, look at things like mortality, readmission rates, certain patient safety indicators. And the, the, um, the blue diamonds are surgical specialty studies. The gold diamonds are medical specialty studies. And they found that patient safety was better in a few studies looking at people admitted to medical services, although one found that patient safety was worse. Um, and then all of the studies, the large studies looking at surgical admissions, found that patient safety was either no different or was worse. 
despite no data showing um, a clear increase in patient safety, the Institute of Medicine in 2009 published a report recommending even tighter duty hours. And ACGME followed up with that um, and made it a reality in 2011. So based on one of these single institutional studies um, on a single ward in the hospital, they shortened the intern maximum shift length to 16 hours. And they shortened the shift length for the seniors to 24 plus 4 instead of plus 6. But then that gave us an opportunity to compare the 2011 hours to looser duty hours um, and see if patient safety was affected. So the first trial uh, was the surgery specialty um, approach to this. They had two groups that they were randomized. They had a control group with standard duty hours, meaning the 2011 ACGME policies. And they had an experimental group with flexible hours. So they got rid of the 16 hour max for interns and they got rid of a maximum shift length for seniors. They were looking at 30-day um, postoperative death and serious complications. They found no difference. Furthermore, they looked at a lot of secondary outcomes and found no difference in things like pneumonia, renal failure, unplanned reoperation, sepsis, surgical site infections, and UTIs. Um, they, they also looked at resident perceptions of their experience, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Another large study, um, not just looking at surgical patients, was published in 2014 in JAMA, and this looked at 6.3 million Medicare admissions um, and found no difference in 30-day mortality or readmission rates before and after 2011. So patient safety wasn't necessarily better. Um, the next thing we'll look at is the degradation of professionalism and identity. And so there was one concern that people were going to see themselves as shift workers. And there was the other concern that if someone really wanted to do the right thing for a patient and stay past their duty hours, that would put them in a moral predicament of doing the right thing for that patient um, or lying and lying on their duty hours um, if they didn't want their program to get in trouble. Because it wasn't a good thing if your program lost its accreditation, right? You want to graduate from an accredited program. Um, but how do you study this? There were plenty of editorials uh, and people who had very strong thoughts about this, um, but the University of Pennsylvania tried to study it. So they, they published this paper where they had um, four graduate students in sociology follow around 10 internal medicine residents and 12 general surgery residents. They showed up at the same time at work as them. They followed them around for the entire day. They left at the same time. They did overnight shifts. They watched them log their duty hours. Um, and they took field notes the whole time. Um, there was concern that there was going to be some observation bias, but they noted that very quickly residents seemed to not care to, to censor themselves. You know, The stress of work kind of overcame that concern. And this is what they found. They found that even when residents were entitled to leave work, they often chose to stay because they had a strong sense that there was a right or a thorough way to care for patients, which took precedence over the clock and their personal concerns. They didn't see themselves as shift workers who were entitled to leave. They stayed and did the right thing for patients when they needed to. Second, they noticed that although they recognized that some situations required their violating duty hour rules, they did not do so without considering the consequences. So they were striking that balance between taking good care of patients um, and still following the rules that they were supposed to follow. So that was a thoughtful process for them. They weren't just choosing one um, easily. And third, residents often forgot how many hours they worked, reported inconsistently and sporadically, and as a result, fudged their hours. This fudging was not understood as a moral breach. It was kind of protective that at the end of the week, if you're trying to log your duty hours and you don't know what time you went home on Tuesday, it was probably fine, and it's going to save you time if you just logged that everything went well. Um, and you know, if you didn't really remember, well, you're not lying. You just don't remember, so, <laughs> so that's fine. Um, so the last objection was that there would be a decrease in educational quality. The easiest way probably to look at this would be board pass rates. So they looked at this in internal medicine and there was no difference in board pass rates um, for our specialty. But for general surgery, that was not the case. So this dark um, gray dotted line is board pass rates for general surgery, which was statistically significant. Um, and there were also decreases in pass rates for thoracic surgeries written and oral examinations. Uh, which were also up here. This dark line is um, ophthalmology test retakers. 
So board pass rates is one easy objective way to look at this. Um, but the iCompare trial, which was published last month, um, sought to look at this in a few different ways. So the iCompare trial is internal medicine's answer to general surgery's first trial. It's a, a way for us to look at 2011 duty hours in a control group and compare them to more flexible hours. So again, they did away with maximum shift lengths and they did away with um, mandated time off between shifts. So they were looking at patient safety just like the first trial, but they also looked at education, burnout, and then intern sleep and alertness. The patient safety data and the intern sleep and alertness data isn't back yet. They, they're still waiting on Medicare data um, to report on this, but they did release what they've learned about education and burnout, and we'll talk about both of those. So for education, they went for the low-hanging fruit with in-training exam scores. They found no difference um, in the groups with, with um, strict 2011 duty hours and more flexible hours. But then they thought, well, maybe a good surrogate for education is time spent on educational activities. So things like um, direct patient care and going to educational conferences. And what they found is that there was no difference in the percentage of time spent on these activities between the two groups. They did note, though, that the mean shift time for both flexible programs and standard programs was 11 something hours. So even though the flexible programs had the ability to make their shifts much longer, on average, the shift length was the same for both programs. Um, so potentially that is confounding this a little bit. So we talked about education, and now I want to talk about what they showed about intern perceptions and burnout, um, because I think it's important um, for where we might be headed. So they looked at intern perceptions, and on the left here is flexible programs, longer hours, on the right is standard programs, 2011 hours. And these were all, I, I highlighted everything with a red box where the more flexible group had negative perceptions about their experience. So they thought that, that patient uh, care was less safe. They noted that they had less time to attend conferences. They had um, less fulfilling relationships with other residents. There was less time for teaching medical students. They uh, had negative perceptions on professionalism, on job satisfaction, satisfaction with their career choice, with their morale, time for with family, time for hobbies, um, and then telling, I think, is that intern overall well-being, 26% of the interns in the flexible group were not, had a negative perception of their well-being um, versus 6% in the 2011 hours. And this um, also played out with intern dissatisfaction. So more of these um, interns in the flexible groups were dissatisfied with the quality of their education, with their overall well-being, um, with their time for rest, with their schedule. And this um, basically agrees with the findings that the first trial had as well. Those surgical residents in more flexible programs um, overall had more negative perceptions about their well-being. But looking at a more objective measure um, in burnout, they looked at the Maslach uh, burnout inventory, found no difference between the two groups. But while there was no difference, it was still striking how many of these interns were burned out. On the emotional exhaustion subscale, um, 79 and 72% of interns had a higher moderate score. On the depersonalization subscale, um, both groups were above 70% as well. And for personal accomplishment subscale, 71 and 69% of interns had a low or moderate score. So interns were burned out. So where are we now? ACGME used the data um, from the tr all the data, the trials that have been um, accruing since 2011 to make a few changes. First, they changed the, um, the name of duty hours to clinical experience and education slash work hours. So a little rebranding, um, trying to, to get away from the idea that these are strict shift work duty hours and really get towards um, the idea that patient safety and care is really important as well and that this is not always a black and white thing. They reversed the intern maximum shift length, um, largely because of the, the results of the first trial, showing no difference in patient safety. So interns, again, were able to work 24 plus 4 hours. And they noted that residents may stay beyond scheduled hours. So there may be unusual circumstances where a resident thinks that that may benefit patient care or education. So obviously duty hours have had a huge impact on residencies throughout the country. Residencies really had to overhaul how they did things. It was expensive. 
Um, I'm sure it was a huge headache for program directors around the country. But I think the more lasting legacy is it led to an incredible amount of data and study into some really important areas. If you were going to argue that patient safety might be adversely affected by these, then you had to know what affects patient safety. Um, so the ideas about systems-based thinking versus blaming, blaming an individual person um, really took off. The PDSA cycle and using that in clinics, um, looking at handoffs and are handoffs actually dangerous, what makes a good handoff versus a bad handoff. It led into more research into educating residents. Is it more important how time is spent for residents? Are scores an adequate enough um, surrogate for education? And ACGME has rearranged how they evaluate doctors now. So they're looking at competencies um, rather than just, did this resident go through this many ICU rotations? Okay, they're probably good enough. No, now we're looking at individual residents and are they competent in these important areas? And lastly, it, it kind of, I think, well, I don't know if it surprised people, but a finding that came out of all this research into duty hours was that residents liked working shorter hours. And it led into um, a study into, you know, resident wellness and what affects that. Um, so things like sleep and alertness, continuity of patient care and how that might affect their wellness and their, the meaningful um, work that they do. Their resident workload and clinical experience, their mood and burnout perceptions, is that important, how residents see their training? Um, importance of resident personal life, and then also um, physician-patient relationships. So we've talked about the era of expansion, how residency spread throughout the country. We've talked about how medicine was changed by Medicare and the payment scheme to become much more fast-paced. We talked about how the public held us accountable for their own safety, which led to the creation of duty hours, which may or may not be making a difference for patient safety. So my question now is what comes next? Is it the era of evidence where we take all of the changes that were made here and put them to the test and really um, fine tune duty hours to actually uh, accomplish the objectives they set out to accomplish? Is it the era of competence where with the way ACGME evaluates residents, are we going towards a time where a resident may be able, be able to graduate from internal medicine residency in two years if they're meet all the competencies, or you know, maybe it would take four years for some to meet those competencies, where there wouldn't be a prescribed length to a residency. Or could it be the era of humanity, where we note that resident wellness and burnout is important, and we look at how attendings as well are burnt out and are not professionally satisfied, and we keep digging into why that is and how we can preserve um, our professional identities. So I want to thank Dr. Page, Dr. Vogelman, um, all the APDs, many of whom watched this talk already, um, my co-chiefs, Kevin, Amber, and Peter. I could not have imagined a better group um, to go through this year. And then also all of our residents who work so hard for us, make this job meaningful for all of us, um, and make it a lot of fun as well. Dr. Saunders, that was outstanding. One housekeeping issue I just need to mention. Please notice that the exits are blocked off on this side during construction over the next several months. That's going to be ongoing. Thanks to Dr. Bridges' great influence, there is no construction during Grand Rounds on Fridays, but, which is wonderful. But if there is a fire, go that way, not that way. Um, Scott, I'll ask you to call on the audience and please repeat the questions. So the question is about a program in Missouri um, where doctors are able to kind of be on an accelerated track, not go through residency, um, and quickly get into underserved populations. 
and can practice without residency. Do I think that will proliferate? I, I'm, so I'm not familiar with that program. I think just off the top of my head, there are some problems with that and some potential, um, is that the right thing to, to allow underserved patients to be treated by doctors who potentially aren't trained? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure, if, too, if they've looked at patient safety data for those things. Um, I don't know. I don't think residency is going anywhere. But I, th I, I do think it might be shifted to become shorter if you are competent. But yeah, it's, I'll have to look into that. So the question is, is the ACGME survey data taken in, into any of these um, recommendations? I don't think so from looking at this. The, the whole impetus for passing duty hours was to um, better patient safety. And the first trial showed us that surgical residents did not like working those more flexible hours. But in 2011, they relaxed the hours. Um, so I, th I think they're kind of noting it. And um, it's probably leading to more research, but I don't think as far as actually determining the duty hours themselves, it's it's really taking um, that much into consideration. Steve, yeah. Yeah, um, so in this era of first line for medicine, um, we're now, we recognize that there are people in the kind of clinic that for some people are more and more um, resistant to the effects of sleep deprivation, some that really are sensitive to this record, and another kind of future path for surgery. So, you know, could you imagine we sat in this room, how could you imagine that there would be Yeah, so the, the question is, or I guess that all doctors are not the same, and some doctors may not be even physically suited for the same kind of specialties in terms of like sleep deprivation, um, and would that potentially lead into deciding where people could specialize? That's a really interesting question. I, I, I think medicine in general is interesting in that we all kind of choose this path and choose residency without really knowing what it's going to be like and hope that we like it. You know, and, and some people switch out once they find out that they don't. Um, potentially, I don't know. But I think you convincing a medical student that they may need, like not be able to stay up long enough to go into a specialty would be hard if they really wanted to do that specialty. Um, we're all pretty driven people. Yeah, so the comment is that residents are obviously not the only ones going through all of this. The attendings are going through it alongside us and may have different outlooks, and they do have different outlooks. So the iCompare trial looked at program director um, perceptions of more flexible duty hours, and program directors liked it more. Um, so thinking about this all as a team is, is an important thing to do. Um, and there's, there's also the argument that, you know, Doctors are going to go out and practice without duty hours, so why are we putting them in, them in this artificial environment now? You know, I, th I think duty hours are flawed inherently in that they're not accomplishing the goal that they were set out to accomplish. I think we're stuck with them, so no matter what, they're going to be there because if we tried to get rid of them, I think the government would legislate it for us. Um, so I think, it's a, I think it's a growing process for, for everyone involved. And, you know, residents that come in now, We've known nothing besides duty hours, so we don't know how things used to be. Um, but things certainly have changed for attendings. Um, absolutely, that's true. We're going to have to close there. I want to thank Dr. Saunders again.